Hi, my name is Dr Helen Howells and I'm a GP with a specialist interest in allergy. And thank you for, to those of you that joined us for the webinar that I host that I did in conjunction with the anaphylaxis campaign, which was very successful. Following on from that, we had so many questions that we decided it would be simplest if I read out the various questions we had to you and record the answers so that you can all have some further learning. So excuse me if I keep looking down, I'm obviously just reading out the questions. So some of the questions we had were around referrals and the allergy clinic process. So one of them said, when and where should we refer allergic patients to secondary care? So there are actually some nice guidelines that exist to tell you which patients to refer. Um, and those are that it's recommended that anybody who has obviously a severe allergic reaction to food, which would um, of course include anaphylaxis, should be referred. And those that have food allergy with asthma, remembering that they're increased risk, at increased risk of anaphylaxis, they should be referred. Anybody who's multiply allergic should be referred, particularly because they're likely to be um, needing to see a dietitian to make sure that they don't have any issues with their growth. Anybody where there's parental suspicion of food allergy, even if you as the referring clinician doesn't necessarily think that there's food allergy, there's often a really good re reason to refer those people on because um, you may find that parents may be giving them quite restrictive diets um, and sometimes unpicking that diagnosis and those labels is equally just as important. Um, it's also recommended that those that have any issues around growth, particularly thinking about the severe and on IgE allergies um, or those with IgE mediated allergies with issues of um, growth, they need to be referred to us. Um, and also NICE does include anybody with atopic eczema um, should be referred. I think that often uh, there's often worth thinking about whether or not you think um, allergy is involved with the eczema. Perhaps in an older child or an adult, it may be more appropriate to refer um, people with eczema to dermatologists rather, rather than allergy clinics, but that is certainly set as a referral guideline. Um, those people would all be referred on to secondary care. There are obviously other allergic reasons may, why you may um, refer on. So thinking about those with um, severe allergic rhinoconjunctivitis that's not getting better with treatment or who may be needing um, immunotherapy um, or severe asthmatics, they also may need to be referred on. Certainly in Southampton where I work, we are happy to see any children with an IgE mediated allergy because we think it's really important that parents are given the correct advice from the start and that they're appropriately managed and followed up um, to work out when the right time may be that that food can be reintroduced. Um, that does vary around the country and in some areas um, there would be advice, advice and guidance given back to GPs as to how to manage, for example, IgE mediated egg allergy in the community. That's quite a common allergy and sometimes they will give you advice about that. So it's worth um, liaising with your local hospital to see what they do. Somebody has asked if allergy clinics are now open. Um, obviously we are now in September, so the COVID um, pandemic has been going on through the year and things have been changed. As far as I'm aware, no allergy clinics were actually shut um, even through the height of the pandemic, but things were restructured. So as with so many things, there was a lot of virtual clinic appointments that took place um, and things like skin prick tests and blood tests were on hold and also food challenges. Of course, we can't keep things on hold forever. So uh, those things are now being done. Um, but of course, things may change again as we enter the winter, um, particularly if we do, um, and hopefully we won't, but if we do get a second peak. So again, it's about liaising with your local area. It will probably be different from area to area, depending on how much they're affected by COVID. But certainly allergy clinics are open at the moment. I've also been asked, are there waiting um, lists for allergy appointments? The answer to that is yes, there are unfortunately waiting lists. Um, I don't think there's a specialty that exists where there aren't waiting lists. And again, that will vary depending on where you live in the country um, and how many services there are available to you. Um, in the Wessex area where I am, the waiting lists are quite good for paediatric allergy clinics. Um, but I know that because adult allergists are in short supply and there are clinics which are in great demand that their waiting lists do tend to be much longer. Um, so yes, some patients are left waiting many, many months before they can be seen. So again, liaise with your local hospital and find out what exists. 
have been asked, can we manage allergic patients in primary care, especially whilst there are limited allergy clinics during COVID-19? That's an interesting question. Um, I think like with so many things, it really depends on your level of experience um, and what you're talking about really. So um, there are gold standards of treatment. Um, and I think that although things have been limited by COVID, we should still follow the guidance and be aware, for instance, that if somebody's had anaphylaxis, even though you may feel fairly confident manage them in primary care, um, the standards are that they should be referred to secondary care. And um, there may be much more that we can do in primary care to support our patients while they're waiting for their clinic appointments. But I don't think that we shouldn't be referring somebody just because we're worried that those services um, are currently overwhelmed or redirected. Um, I think it's important that we manage patients with IgE mediated um, allergies in primary care appropriately. So that would be giving them a management plan, um, teaching patients and families how to recognise mild to moderate re allergic reactions and how to treat those and teaching them how to recognise the signs of anaphylaxis. It's vital that families and patients are prescribed adrenaline auto injectors appropriately and following MHRA guidelines and the new NICE guidelines, they should be given two adrenaline auto injectors to carry at all times. It is our role in primary care to make sure that patients our families are trained in how to use those adrenaline auto injectors and making sure their training is kept up to date. Um, we can also support them by directing them to useful um, charities such as the anaphylaxis campaign where they can get more information and support and making sure they understand about food labeling and how to keep themselves safe if they're eating out. So there's lots of management we can also give alongside for these families whilst awaiting their yeah, referral. So moving on, these um, set of questions are more about anaphylaxis and also a little bit around adrenaline auto injectors. So somebody said, what do you do if you see precipitate in the window when you're checking the adrenaline auto injector before giving? And is there anything you can do to fix it? So as you may recall, we've said before you give the adrenaline auto injector, you should check that it's in date and you should check that the window um, containing the fluid is clear and isn't murky. Now, there isn't anything that I'm aware of that you can do to change it if the precipitant is murky. And if somebody's just checking their adrenaline auto injector as standard and notices that, then they should request a new prescription and, and, and obtain a new adrenaline auto injector. If in the moment, um, somebody has a has an anaphylaxis and they need to use something and they don't have anything else available. Um, it is tricky, but I think you probably, depending on how severe the anaphylaxis is, you may want to go ahead and give it, um, or it might be that they want to um, monitor the situation closely, have called an ambulance and wait to see whether or not things progress. So I can't give a definite answer because if the fluid does look really murky, then technically speaking, they shouldn't use it. Um, but it's like so many things, if you're absolutely desperate and you've got nothing else to use and they're having severe anaphylaxis, then they may choose to use it. Along that vein, somebody else has said, you know, in the instructions for use, as I've said, it says check the expiry date. Um, and they've said, if out of date, the advice is still to use it, will this just increase stress? So again, that's a similar sort of scenario, really, that hopefully people will be aware that their adrenaline auto injectors are when they need to be changed. And on the manufacturer's website, patients and families can sign up to get alerts to tell them that their adrenaline auto injector is due for renewal. So that's a really good thing to do. Again, it probably depends how out of date it is. So if it were only a month out of date and you've got absolutely nothing else to use and you're concerned about the anaphylaxis, then it might be that someone um, goes on and gives it. But it's very difficult to give that advice, I suppose, from a medical legal point of view. Uh, when we, you know when it is out of date, it, it is unlikely that it's going to cause harm, but it may be that it isn't successful. So I think um, each person probably has to make a decision about what they're going to do in that situation. Our advice as health professionals would be to make sure that they're in date in the first place, uh, and it is a step to take. Um, hopefully, it won't increase the anxiety too much um, at the time of anaphylaxis. Another question is, following the recall of the Emirate auto-injectors, can you advise on suitable alternatives to the Emirate 500 micrograms? So yes, the suitable alternatives would be either a JEX 300 micrograms or an EpiPen 300 micrograms. Um, and as you may be aware, 
there are several um, areas of concern around this, one being the fact that the MRA 500 micrograms had a longer needle. Now there are studies that have been since published showing that even in larger individuals or those with very um, big thigh muscles for instance, even with the smaller needle lengths that come with the 300 micrograms, sufficient dose of adrenaline reached the bloodstream with the 300 micrograms um, when it was given into the muscle with a shorter needle length. So families don't need to worry about that. The other concern you might imagine would be that 300 micrograms is obviously a smaller dose than the 500 micrograms. And again, there is another study showing that the 300 micrograms is sufficient, that you will get sufficient levels of adrenaline into the blood to treat anaphylaxis. So families being prescribed 300 micrograms instead of the 500 micrograms don't need extra pens. Um, it's really like for like, so they should be given two 300 microgram um, adrenaline auto injectors of either Jex or EpiPens. And somebody said, do we stop doing demos for the MRA pens from now on during training? And the answer to that is yes, at the moment, all of the MRA pens, the 150, 300 and 500 microgram pens have all been recalled, so they shouldn't be in circulation anymore. If somebody is having anaphylaxis and all they have available is the MRA pens, then of course they should still use it. Um, it is likely that those pens would be triggered, but we are, it has been found that you need a higher level of pressure to um, initiate and activate that pen um, than is safe, and that's why they've been recalled. The ideal is that we should be looking at our patient lists, identifying people who've been prescribed with emirates and contacting them now or hopefully earlier in the year even, explaining to them they need to hand their emirates back to the pharmacy um, so that they can be sent back to the manufacturer and issuing with an alternative and of course making sure they are trained up in how to use the new pens. Somebody has said that they've had a request from a nursery for an EpiPen protocol for a specific child. They said, is there a standard one that exists or who should be responsible for one for writing one for a child? So there are standard ones that are used. If you look at the Basaki website, so basaki.org, B-S-A-C-I, so that's for just Society of Allergy and Clinical Immunology. In the search engine on that website, if you type in action plan, you will now find three, one for EpiPen, one for Jex, and one for allergic reactions where no adrenaline auto injector has been issued. These are actually for children rather than adults. In primary care, I have to say I do print them out because there currently isn't a standard one for adults. And I think they're really useful to still show adults um, what the signs of a mild to moderate allergic reaction are. And it reminds them on their what um, they should do, i.e. what antihistamine to take. And it also reminds them what the signs of anaphylaxis are and the actions to take. So I still think they're useful for adults, but hopefully an adult allergy action plan will be initiated. If you're prescribing the adrenaline auto injector in primary care and somebody is, say, waiting for their um, allergy appointment, then I guess you are responsible for providing that action plan. And it would be really nice if you could print that off for the families um, and they should carry it with them everywhere they go because they're really useful reminders. But then one can also be given to schools or nurseries or childminders. If that patient is under secondary care, then it would be their responsibility to make sure they've got an action plan. I've been told by um, parents that some doctors won't prescribe for primary children for adrenaline auto injectors. Is this correct or does it differ from region to region? I think that's one of those things that I can't really tell you what everybody is doing. Um, I can only tell you what the MHRA guidelines are and what the NICE guidelines are. And that is that everybody should have two adrenaline injectors with them at all times. Now, the reason that I prescribe four and in our clinic setting, we prescribe four for primary school children is that they're small school sites and um, as you may know if you have children if you're at primary school age you would have to sign that drug into the school office every day and then go and sign it out every day in order to take it home and that just isn't something that logistically makes any sense for families and schools wouldn't be very happy with that about that and particularly at the moment during COVID it's even more important because they don't want anybody in the school office so signing in medicine daily is, is something that's not feasible. Those primary school children should be walking to school with their adrenaline auto injectors and being collected from school, they should be carrying them. But whilst they're in school, it'd be much more sensible that they have two adrenaline auto injectors on site. And therefore I would hope that certainly secondary care doctors are going to prescribe for 
and hopefully in primary care doctors um, maybe understand or can be educated by people like me to realise the importance of why we're asking them to have four. Personally speaking, for some children I prescribe an extra two and the scenario of when I give another two is for example with divorced parents, if, if mum is dropping off to school and dad is collecting on another day, then again it may be too difficult for them to be handing back adrenaline auto injectors to and fro. For secondary school children I tend to prescribe three two that they carry with them at all times but I do still keep one in the school office and although secondary schools are very large sites um, it just means then that if that teenager as we know sometimes they're a little bit irresponsible sorry to be um, generalized but sometimes they may well have lost their school bag or their jacket where their adrenaline auto injectors were at least somebody could potentially run to the school office for them and get that adrenaline auto injector whilst they're waiting for the ambulance to arrive of course, with the spare pens in school initiative, it would be great if all, si if all schools signed up and had an, an extra adrenaline auto injector that they kept in the school office. That may well abate some of the problems that exist. But at the moment, the uptake of that is relatively low. And along that vein, somebody's asked us what the price of a Jex or an EpiPen is. And it does vary from pharmacy to pharmacy. So schools are able to purchase them. Generally, individuals wouldn't be able to purchase them without prescriptions. And the cost, I believe, on the NHS is around £35 for a pen. Um, and privately, if you are buying them through the pharmacy website, I think it's about £37 to £50 per adrenaline auto injector, depending on what site you use. I've been asked, are there any changes to the shelf life for adrenaline auto injectors? Um, and yes, the answer to that is for the EpiPens. They used to be 20 months, and now that has been extended to 24 months, so two years. And that's in line with jets that are also two years. So all adrenaline auto injectors have a two year shelf life. There are sometimes changes that are made further um, when there are issues with supply. And it's useful if there are ever issues with supply, if people are saying they can't get hold of them from pharmacies or you're hearing from pharmacies that there are stock issues. If you look at the Basaki websites, if you look at the manufacturers for jets or EpiPen websites, and I suspect if you look at the anaphylaxis campaign or the Allergy UK, um, websites, they will probably have details about sometimes where they have extended the shelf life further for specific batch um, lot numbers. So it's always worth just keeping an eye on those websites should any issues arise. I understand the dose for the adrenaline auto injector is age adjusted. Does body weight influence the dose for the adrenaline auto injector administered? And yes, this depends really on what guidelines you're looking at. So with the recess guidelines, they tend to go on um, age roughly as to what a dose of adrenaline to give. But actually, um, certainly in terms of when we're prescribing it in clinic, we use body weight rather than age. And depending on whether you use Jext or EpiPen, it is slightly different. So the EpiPen is licensed the 0.15 milligram dose or the 150 microgram dose is licensed from 7.5 kilos to 25 kilos and then over 25 kilos you'd give them the 0.3 milligram or 300 microgram dose of EpiPen and for checks their licensing is from 15 kilograms to 30 kilograms you would give them the smaller 150 microgram dose and once they reach 30 kilos you would switch them onto 300 microgram dose. Could you please confirm that if adrenaline is given wrongly, it does no harm? Somebody said they just want to get a clear understanding. And I think that comes around concern over what if you accidentally or what if you give the adrenaline when actually somebody wasn't having anaphylaxis in the first place. And that is actually a message that we always try to get home to our families in clinic, that particularly for young, fit, healthy children, you're never actually going to do any harm by giving them that dose of adrenaline. And as an example in Southampton, we often have teenagers, or not often, but we sometimes have teenagers who really struggle with anxiety around using their adrenaline or two injectors. And if they are at quite high risk of anaphylaxis, then our lovely psychologist does lots of work with them. And the end product of her work is actually to build up so that on the day, on the day unit, they are actually able to administer to themselves a dose of their adrenaline or two injector at a time when they're not having anaphylaxis. And the most that tends to happen is perhaps the heart rate raises, but it is a safe thing to do. So for our families, we say, look, if you're in doubt, it is safer and better to give the adrenaline. And then we can unpick the scenario afterwards. We can discuss it and we may discuss and decide, you know, if that happened again, perhaps we wouldn't use the adrenaline auto injector. 
but we certainly wouldn't be telling them off for using it inappropriately um, as long as they've given it with the right reasons. For most adults also that would be exactly the same that if in doubt please always use it. There are some drugs that will block the action of adrenaline so um, beta blockers or ACE inhibitors um, but it's, it's rather that it blocks the action rather than it's not safe to use it. So definitely if somebody thinks maybe they're having anaphylaxis, you know, if it's, it might sometimes be a vague symptom of that feeling of something in their throat, which is um, often a worry about their airway, then we do say use it, we can unpick it afterwards and we can discuss it further from that point. Um, is there any way primary care can set up monitoring of pens coming up from expiry? I think the answer to that is probably no. Um, you can more than likely set up a reminder on the systems you use, like System One or EpiPen, of when they would, um, you think, be due for a renewal of their prescription, bearing in mind they each last two years. But the difficulty is you wouldn't know the expiry date of the pen that's been given from pharmacy. So we do say to our families, you know, when you're picking up your adrenaline or your injector, make sure you've got a good shelf life on it and it's not one that's near the end of it. Um, but it could be that the pen that's being given only has 20 months rather than 24 months left. So the best thing to do is to ask families to sign up for a reminder um, on the manufacturer's website. Okay, can patients with severe airborne anaphylaxis to latex access or be prescribed additional adrenaline auto injectors in the current COVID crisis um, with several other risk factors? Um, I think the answer to that is that there shouldn't really be any need for it. If you're not aware, I think part of the concerns are that because everybody is obviously worried about COVID and lots of people are trying to access their own protective equipment, many people are going out and buying gloves and some of the gloves that are now more freely available are of course latex gloves. Um, in the older days, when there was lots of latex available in the hospital, that's why we saw latex allergies rise. And so latex has mostly been removed from hospitals, as I'm sure you're aware, and we use the nitrile gloves instead. Um, and then precautions are put in place for anybody who comes into hospital needing a, needing a procedure who has a latex allergy. Now with much more latex being around in the environment, of course it's quite worrying for patients that they may accidentally be exposed to latex and probably can't take as many precautions as they otherwise would because you can't obviously um, help what other people are doing. You know, they may accidentally be touched by somebody who's um, wearing latex gloves. But it would be the same as anybody else who, who has anaphylaxis. But if that does happen, you would use your adrenaline auto injector and then you would ring 999. And then if needs be, if they didn't improve after five to 10 minutes, they would use their other adrenaline auto injector in their other leg. They shouldn't need any more than that because you would hope that an ambulance would have got to them by that and um, particularly there shouldn't be any delays um, ringing up 999 and saying that you have anaphyl having anaphylaxis should prompt an urgent ambulance response. Of course at that point once that person's been treated they should be prescribed more adrenaline auto injectors to replace what they've lost. So I would say that they don't need any more than the two because they should have an ambulance um, come to them in, in the right length of time and then they can be further managed from there. Somebody's asked, how can patients get a medical alert bracelet? So these are something that can be privately bought. Um, and I just see that on the anaphylaxis campaign, their uh, website, there are some links to some sites where you can buy it, um, such as Mediband. There are others available like Medic Alert. You can Google them and find various ones um, that might suit that person's style um, that they can wear. And usually that's certainly for me something I advise for anybody with a drug allergy. Um, I think it's very sensible that they wear these medical alert bands. Okay, so a few more kind of individual scenarios here. We've had concerns from mothers who have food allergy in the family and have concerns about weaning their infants. What advice should we give? Okay, so first of all, there is some really good advice that exists on Basaki. So you can look at the British Society of Allergy and Clinical Immunology's um, feeding guidelines and there are some nice clear fact sheets for you about what to do. Other things to say, so if mum or dad has a food allergy then all that does to the infant or the child in their family is increases that child's risk of another atopic condition. So eczema, asthma, allergic rhinoconjunctivitis or potentially a food allergy. 
Just because, for instance, dad has a peanut allergy, it doesn't necessarily increase the child's risk of having exactly the same thing. So that often helps families in the first instance. Then between siblings, again, it's a similar thing that it might increase the child's risk, the, the next sibling's risk of having an atopic condition. But between siblings, they, they're not necessarily allergic to the same thing, but there is a link with peanut allergy between siblings that they have a 20% increased risk of having a, a food allergy. The British Society of Allergy um, weaning guidelines say that if the child that you're discussing, so the baby in front of you, has no atopic conditions themselves, then they are not particularly at any higher risk. And therefore, they, mums and dads can go on and wean them normally and just monitor for allergic reactions as they would already probably know how to recognise. So they should still go on and introduce foods in the normal way of a normal weaning baby. If those families felt too anxious to do that, then sometimes that is where allergy clinics get involved. But you can imagine we can't possibly see all of these babies if families are saying, well, I'm not going to give them peanut or egg or any of the high allergens, the risky allergens, until they've been screened, then that is a good reason to send them to secondary care for further evaluation. The infants that are at higher risk are those who have um, eczema, particularly where it's sort of more severe eczema, where they're perhaps using regular steroids, um, or those who have a food allergy. So, for instance, those who have an egg allergy are at higher risk of having a peanut allergy. And in some countries and some societies recommend that those infants should be screened um, before peanut or before egg is introduced. But the British Society of um, Allergy Guidelines do say that if it is acceptable to those families, they can actually go on and wean at home. And the advice I basically give is I explain to them how to recognise allergic reactions. And for some families, I would actually prescribe um, some antihistamines, so Puriton. It is off licence in the under ones, but we know that it's safe to use so that they have it at home so they feel a bit safer. I also reassure them that there haven't been deaths from the weaning process, um, but there has been anaphylaxis that has occurred, that they would be able to access help quickly. Um, and obviously it would be a scary process. And having had a child myself who's had a significant allergic reaction when I was weaning him, it isn't, it isn't nice. Even as a doctor, it really did freak me out and worry me. So it is very difficult for these families. But for instance, if we're talking about peanut, I might say on the very first day, just give the very tip of a teaspoon of peanut butter. If there's been no reaction um, on day one and you monitor them closely for a couple of hours, then on day two, double the amount you give it. And on day three, you know, double it further and just slowly introduce it that way. And once each allergen has been tried several times, then you can go on and introduce something else. And a lot of families will feel happier doing that by just having some advice about how to introduce things in smaller quantities and um, having that slight reassurance of having an antihistamine at home and perhaps printing them an action plan of not the one that's needed with the adrenaline auto injector, but of how to recognise mild to moderate reactions or how to recognise anaphylaxis. So that in the heat of the moment, if something happens, they've got something to refer to to help them um, to go on. But if families feel that their child has eczema and they can't possibly go on and introduce these allergens, then that usually does prompt a more urgent referral through to the allergy clinic. Because particularly around egg and peanut, we do know that there is a correct time for weaning. So a time where we would ideally like to get these foods into the diet, um, where it would then mean that children would be less likely to go on and develop allergies. And also, of course, for growth and nutrition, we want these foods into their diet. So if families feel that they can't wean without further guidance from secondary care, then that would be a reason um, to refer them on and would be something that would be accepted by most people. Even if sometimes it's just that we phone them and give them further advice and support. Obviously, that is difficult with current um, COVID pandemic and, and the changes that we have with referrals and the sort of unstable um, life we're living in the, at the moment of not knowing how things might change today to day. Um, but I think we should think about the bigger picture of what, what is the right thing that we should be doing for our families, what are the services that you know are normally there and then sometimes we might just have to step, have a step back and think about how the situation is affecting us locally and whether or not we're going to get that quick guidance for them. You will find most allergists would be at the end of a phone or an email or a choosing um, or an advice and guidance letter um, to give you some support if need be. And there are certainly also GPs with a specialist interest like me that exist across the country that would also, I'm sure, help and give you some support. Um, are people with peanut allergy and hay fever more at risk? And I think that's more at risk of anaphylaxis. 
Um, so the two together don't necessarily don't give you an increased risk of anaphylaxis. Um, we know that those people with food allergy and asthma are at higher risk of anaphylaxis, um, but the same doesn't follow for hay fever. So although allergic rhinitis um, and asthma, we do talk about one airway now, hay fever on its own isn't a risk factor for anaphylaxis. We know that peanuts are quite a risky thing in terms of food allergy. And when you look at the deaths that occur from anaphylaxis, which thankfully are small in number, but still do exist, um, there is a higher risk associated with, with nut allergies. Um, but hay fever doesn't have any relationship to that. Somebody said that they have a small baby that presents with urticaria, so hives after eating a peanut butter sandwich. Um, should they prescribe them an adrenaline auto injector? And the answer to that is um, no, not necessarily. So you need to take a really clear allergy focused history, find out what has happened and make sure that you're happy um, that it was likely that the peanuts caused an allergic reaction. And then you want to specifically inquire, did they have any signs of anaphylaxis? So any ABC airway breathing, circulation or, con or consciousness um, issues. And if they didn't have any signs of anaphylaxis, then at this point, we wouldn't need to prescribe them an adrenaline auto injector. It would actually be off license for those smaller babies um, that weigh less than seven and a half kilos. So that usually is something that would be left more to secondary care anyway. The time that it tends to be prescribed is for those who have food allergy and have had anaphylaxis or those have food allergy and asthma, thinking that they're at higher risk. And then there are some other reasons where we consider it, and those are usually teenagers or young adults who are at higher risk of anaphylaxis because of their uh, more risk-taking behaviours, um, because of their more disruptive lifestyles of being busy, less sleep, more travel. Um, we also might consider it for those that live in very remote locations um, who may not be able to access help quickly, or those who've ever reacted to just trace amounts of food but for a normal kind of reaction, there are lots of babies that present having had um, reactions at weaning. Um, and for most of them, they wouldn't need to be prescribed an adrenaline auto injector. Um, with regards to severe anaphylaxis to clarithromycin, do we need to be aware of potential cross reactions with other medications with a similar molecular structure? And they said, they appreciate I won't know the answer to all medications, but would I advise referral? or advice and guidance from secondary care allergy services. So I'm just going to answer that more broadly. So of course, if you're allergic to any antibiotic, then you cannot prescribe any antibiotic in that class of drugs because there would be a potential that they react to it. If you're allergic to penicillin, um, if you actually look up online and we might be able to find a fact sheet that we can add up, you can find information quite nicely about which other drugs can be given safely with the penicillin allergy and which ones you should avoid or be more cautious with um, as their molecular structures are more similar. And that is something you can, you can generally look for quite easily online. In terms of do you refer them? Well, at the moment, allergy, adult allergy services um, would struggle to see everybody with a drug allergy. Um, so, not everybody with drug allergies are referred on. The time that we would tend to recommend that they're referred through to an allergy service which is set up to look at drug allergies um, would be if they were allergic to multiple antibiotics because then there's going to be a difficulty of well, what antibiotic do you give and that can be particularly challenging with our older patients in primary care. So often for me if somebody has is allergic to two different classes of antibiotics then I start to think about, do they need to be seen in secondary care? But certainly if you've got three or more, then I think that's very sensible. Um, if somebody is going to need a drug that they're allergic to, for instance, maybe somebody with cystic fibrosis, then they're often referred through. Um, those with anaesthetic allergies are referred through. Um, those with sort of immune deficiencies where they're highly likely to need these drugs, they're referred through for further ana analysis. We also tend to see um, children who've been labelled with allergies to paracetamol, ibuprofen or local anaesthetics, often because they're actually mislabeled. Um, so to be sure that they're allergic to those things and if they are to give advice on what else can be used as alternatives. There is a big drive to delabel people with penicillin allergies because we know that if you have a label of a penicillin allergy, there's a large audit saying that you are more likely to have longer hospital stays. 
that there's more morbidity associated um, with that, more costs, and actually more risks because you're more likely to be given other more fancy drugs, which actually could potentially cause problems. Um, and there's some work about delabeling penicillin allergies in specialist community allergy clinics, but not everybody has the facilities um, to see all those with penicillin allergies. Um, you can imagine that would swamp allergy services because so many people are labeled with a penicillin allergy. But it's an exciting field and it's kind of a watch this space of these evolving drug allergy clinics really. Does the immune system and genetics play a role in predisp predisposing individuals and or triggering an, an anaphylaxis? So um, in answer to that, certainly we know that genetics does play a role in um, allergy, um, as it probably does in many fields of medicine, really. It's often, you know, what, what causes this condition or well, the environment, genetics, and then other factors. And it's similar with any atopic conditions. And that's why when we were taking an allergy-focused history, we would ask um, for the history of ATP in your first degree relatives, so mum, dad, and siblings, do they have any eczema, asthma, hay fever, or food allergies? And if they do, then that increases the child's risk of having the same or having a condition themselves. In terms of does that trigger the risk of anaphylaxis, I don't believe that necessarily um, runs through the family. Um, and so that's not something I usually ask about. But you will find that, of course, if there is anaphylaxis within the family, um, that there will be an even bigger um, awareness of anaphylaxis and certainly a higher level of anxiety that exists. So you're going to really need to support those families. So yes, genetics certainly play a role. And we, we know the immune system plays a role in that um, an allergic reaction is essentially where the immune system has gone slightly wrong. The immune system is activated to trigger that response. And we also are looking more about um, the gut microbiota being involved in food allergy. So allergy is one of those things where there are lots of different factors that increase that person's risk of allergy. We don't understand it fully. Lots and lots and lots of research is going on. Um, lots of exciting research, but again, we can't ever give somebody a full answer as to why they have the condition. And then finally, do you think it's likely with, that with all the people wearing latex gloves currently, as we've discussed with the COVID pandemic, that there's likely to be an increase in latex allergies? And I think that's, that is, is more than likely, um, given that, as I've said, when latex was very frequently used in hospitals, um, then latex allergy was really quite common when it was removed. And we very rarely see latex allergy coming through in children anymore. So it stands to reason really that if um, latex is being used much more in the community again now, um, and certainly if individuals are exposing themselves to it much more frequently, then there's a possibility that latex allergy may go up again. And I think people should really think about it carefully um, because it does put our patients with latex allergy at risk when they're using these gloves in the community. Okay, and I think that's it. So thank you very much for all of those questions. Um, it just showed how engaged you all were with the webinar. Um, and please do contact the Anaphylaxis Campaign if we can be of any further help. Thank you.